How we doing, Matt? Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Good. Well, can I get a little bit? But good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right. There we go. There we go. Well, it, honestly, it's great to be here and, and great to see everybody. Uh, we're back together for session eight. <clears throat> uh, yes, we are missing a few people. They must have been drawn to the eclipse. Uh, so um, we hope that they're doing well in the uh, and thriving and going to see an extraordinary event in the sky. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, let me say a prayer for us. And then um, I have an opening question. I changed the question, actually, uh, from the one that I sent to you in the email. So uh, we're going to save that one for next week. Uh, so I have a different question for you to consider this morning. So anyway, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for uh, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the time that you give to us to come together to study and to fellowship, to be challenged um, by your word, to have our own faith and um, sense of commitment to you deepened, um, our sense of commitment to our neighbor and to the world that you love, to have those also deep deepened. We pray that you're with us now as we prepare to enter into the book of Hebrews and help us to have ears to hear in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we are in session eight, um, heading, uh, I think we're kind of up into chapter five and making our way. Um, <clears throat> just before I start, we've gone through a, a little bit of like house cleaning wise. We've had a couple of days off here and there. Um, the only other date that I had anticipated possibly taking off was the day after annual meeting, but since we've had to take off so many other days, I think we're just gonna go straight through. So we're gonna come kind of march along unless um, someone gets sick or we have some sort of a weather event um, up until the end of May, and we'll see how far through Hebrews we can get. Uh, and then uh, maybe we'll take up finishing Hebrews in the fall uh, and uh, we'll have to decide what we're going to do after that. So um, I, have some, I have some thoughts. So uh, anyway, um, I want to open uh, w with a question. Uh, this is um, a question that's very much um, appropriate for our uh, passage, but it's also one that uh, I have a little story behind it too. Uh, one of my good uh, friends and colleagues from when I was at Bethel was a New Testament professor, and he loved to um, constantly throw around Mathane Pathane uh, was the saying. And Mathane Pathane means uh, learning is suffering. To learn is to suffer. Uh, he was a Greek uh, expert and sort of uh, you know loved to mess around with words and things. Um, he was the he's the probably one of the professors that students wanted to avoid. Um, until they got him, when they got him and they kind of went through the task of, of you know, being educated by him uh, after that, it was, uh, they had a lot of affection for him. But he loved this saying, Mathane Pathane, this saying also, this idea shows up in our passage today. So I wanted to give you some time to think a little bit about this. I want you to know that this was a commonplace idea in the ancient world, to learn is to suffer. Um, and so uh, you don't have to agree with it. Maybe you don't agree with it, but uh, take some time. What do you think about the suffering, or excuse me, about the saying? And uh, we'll come back and share in about five or so minutes. All right? <laughs> 
So about 30 more seconds. Okay, I want to invite all of you back. Um, we do have a, <clears throat> excuse me, a microphone up here in the center uh, table. So let's make sure as we share that we put this on the microphone so our friends online can hear us. And we also want to, of course, say hello to our friends online. So I've uh, given you this little saying, this, uh, this concept does, again, as I'll, as I'll talk a little bit in a few minutes uh, as we get into it, uh, show up again in our passage. but. Mathain, pathain, to, it's either learning is suffering or to learn is to suffer, <clears throat> is another way that uh, can be rendered. So what did you talk about at your tables in response to this ancient Greek idea? Oh, no one wants to admit. Well, here, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Hello. Okay. Did you have one? Yep. Okay. I was just going to um, say that the book that we're be looking at, Faith and Fake News, um, that came to mind when I saw the question because challenging um, things that you hold to be true or sure, um, and then you go to researcher, research it and find out it's not... it. I'm not sure suffering is the word, but certainly stretching and in some ways suffering as you realize you've held something to be true that isn't. So some kind of resonance there, the difficulty that can happen uh, when you learn, right? Because it, yeah, okay. Yeah, and I think that's kind of part of this is the idea of disequilibrium. When I was a professor at Bethel, I had to, um, really help students along, particularly when they were taking the early Christian theology classes because I didn't teach the class to reinforce what they already believed. And I was saying, you're supposed to experience cognitive dissonance. That is part of the learning process. And cognitive dissonance is not um, always a pleasurable thing to experience. <laughs> it's not comfortable, that's right. And most learning is not comfortable, if we're being honest. Uh, whether we're talking about the learning of walking, the learning of learning new ideas, et cetera. Judy, did you have a comment? Well, I, I couldn't actually understand everything she said because of my hearing, but I talked about going to college and taking a couple of classes, and I really suffered. <laughs> uh, they were very difficult. Um, and, you know, a lot of people, maybe that keeps them from passing that class. And if it's essential to what you want to do in the future, it's really suffering because you have to totally change everything. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I would say that learning the truth is often suffering. I just read some more things about what we have done to the Indians throughout the years and the truth of how awful and terrible and unfair and unsympathetic we were is very painful. Yeah, and I mean, I think there's different, maybe there's even different types of suffering that we might talk about. There's the suffering that comes with, you know, sort of learning the everyday, the suffering that maybe the athlete goes through as they repetitive things with their bodies in order to become peak. But then there's the suffering of like changing our entire view um, of what we thought was and how um, uh, destabilizing that can be. Uh, and that, But that's part of the process of learning, I think, yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe I'm remembering wrong, but didn't Jesus said, suffer the little children to come to me? Uh, the translation says suffer the little children, yes. So what, is, what does suffering mean? 
Well, in this case, suffering, I'm not going to be able to comment on the passage, but in this case, it literally does mean, I think, the idea of, um, of disequilibrium, right? When you suffer, that's a system, a system in dis disequilibrium is kind of the idea. Um, and whether we're talking about physical suffering or intellectual or whatever. Um, and so suffering, in a way, is like a signal that you're alive, right? Something is wrong, uh, and you register it, in a way. And so I think, but I think we could break it down, uh, and I, I would break it down in order to make this intelligible to say it's something like disequilibrium. Um, uh, it's something that destabilizes. Uh, now, that's not the final end, right? So the idea, of course, that this uh, passage, that this little phrase doesn't capture is that hopefully um, as you integrate, right, and you metabolize what you learn, you reach a new state of equilibrium, right? That's kind of the idea. That's where, that would be where the growth, I suppose, part would come in. So this is not the only thing that one can say about learning. And if it is, I would want to stay out of ancient Greek schools because I don't, I don't want to suffer all day, every day. That's the, uh, but it's a part of the process, I think, is kind of the, is sort of where that saying comes from. Did you have a comment, question mark? Are there any comments from our friends online? No? OK. All right. OK, well, let's turn together. Um, let me just kind of remind us a little bit um, of where we are. Just give me one second. I'm going to pull up my electronic Bible here. Um, we are in uh, the fifth chapter of Hebrews. <clears throat> And we have uh, the first, I would say, uh, two chapters of the book of Hebrews uh, um, began a process of establishing the, what we might say, the bona fides or the identity of Jesus as both uh, representative of God, um, but also simultaneously representative of humankind. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> the function um, or the reason that the author uh, goes through that um, <clears throat> process in those two chapters is <clears throat> to make the argument, which, of course, the whole of Hebrews especially seems to be concerned with, that Jesus is uh, a high priest. And in fact, not only a high priest, but the most fitting of all high priests. Um, and that therefore the work that he does is a mediating work. Um, it's a work that's done uh, on behalf of, uh, uh, from the divine side, but also from the human side, et cetera. Um, as you move through uh, chapter, let's see, so we got, I'm trying to think here, I got to kind of pop the cobwebs out of the, I, I think I've still got sand in my shoes uh, from my vacation. So um, one of the things then, if you remember the structure, right, chapter one, we get the highest, some of the most soaring language and description of who Jesus is. And the author has to say, just so that we're clear, we know that Yahweh also has other partners and other associates, and Jesus is in fact superior to them. Those other partners and associates are the angels. And then um, Conversely, uh, a human being who is a partner of Yahweh, um, one of the most obvious examples, I think probably the two that would come to mind for most of authors of this type, would be Abraham or Moses. Moses is the one that the author chooses uh, because Moses is a great example to use for the purpose that the author wants to use. But uh, on, on the other side, Jesus is a servant um, like Moses, and yet he's greater because he's more than just a servant, he's also a son. But um, there's a, there was a predicament or a dynamic that Moses faced that the author clearly is concerned about with the particular community or communities that they're writing to, which is the possibility of turning away. So Moses is particularly discussed and engaged um, as a comparison point, not just because of who Moses was, but because Moses had to deal with the wilderness generation. And the wilderness generation were those Israelites uh, 
who had experienced, not just knew in their heads, but they had experienced the Exodus and all the events with Exodus. They had experienced eating manna in the wilderness, and yet they did not fully trust. And maybe from the author's perspective, they didn't trust at all. I think it's a little bit unfair to say that <laughs> totally blanketly, but they did not fully trust enough to go into the promised land. And so they wind up being consigned to the wilderness um, until more come in, uh, more come along later. We know, of course, that it's not the whole of that generation. There are some included, Joshua, et cetera. So we get that comparison. Um, and part of the reason, of course, for that comparison is because it's a great exhortation. Do not be like the wilderness generation. You have had profound experiences too. Do not turn your back on those experiences. We're not just talking about head knowledge here. We're talking about what you have actually experienced, et cetera. Sort of that seems to be one of the driving reasons um, from the perspective of the author. And then the invitation, of course, is to enter into God's rest. Um, and he utilizes the author here, he or she, of course, utilizes the image of Sabbath um, uh, in chapter four as an, a kind of emblem. And this is one of the you know, really interesting rabbinic moments in this book of Hebrews that tells us that this author was familiar with how rabbis interpreted and engage scripture because <clears throat> the author uses the image of rest um, and plays with the image and sort of um, hooks it to the Sabbath rest at the end of the creation narratives in, G in Genesis, but also the Sabbath rest that the promised land seemed to represent, but then something more than that. It's something even greater, right? So that entering into Sabbath rest to God's rest in a sense, in Hebrews, um, actually means entering into God's presence, into God's way of life, we might want to say. Um, and so the idea is to remain faithful so that one might also fully enter into that way of being. Um, it's possible that the author is imagining uh, that way of being as also somehow identified with the way of being that Jesus himself took because Jesus is one who devotes himself to his neighbors and devotes himself to doing the will of God. And of course, doing the will of God is precisely to be devoted to one's neighbors. Um, and, uh, and it's through that devotion uh, that in a sense, Jesus is understood to quote unquote, become um, a great high priest or like a son, et cetera. So all this kind of interesting language. We then turn at the very end of uh, chapter four to uh, one of the two big sections in the book of Hebrews on the central theme of the book, which is uh, Jesus as high priest. Um, and that will be from, we started some of this material 414, pretty much to the end of 510 material that we'll deal with today, and then we'll switch back Another huge chunk is going to be coming in chapter 7. So once we get up to chapter 7 through 10, we get another three chapters on this theme. So this is really kind of the dri a driving theme uh, for the author uh, to the book of Hebrews. So that's kind of where we are. Uh, when, we, when we get into uh, the section on the high priest material, uh, this is the stuff that's immediately preceding where we're going to pick up here today. Um, we hear about Jesus himself as great high priest who passes through the heavens, and we talked about the imagery there um, that sort of um, uh, imitates in a way uh, the way that the high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement passed through to different portions of the temple to enter into the Holy of Holies. Now, in the, in the mind of, I think, the author to the Hebrews, the imitation is actually reversed. The real entrance, the real procession is what happens in heaven. What happens on earth is an imitation of that. But I'm going to use that language just as, uh, in, in a sense, to make our kind of literary point that we're trying to make. Um, one of the things that's really remarkable, of course, in this letter, which is unique, is the profound emphasis that the author puts on the fact that Jesus can truly sympathize with us that his suffering, 
um, his uh, being human, his bearing weakness, um, et cetera. And we're going to hear more of that today. In fact, we're going to hear probably one of the most potent verses in the whole whole of the book. And I think in a way, a key to how this author thinks about Jesus um, is coming up. But But this is unique in the sense that, yes, high priests are understood to be able to represent the people because they identify with the people. They're one of them. But it doesn't go to the extent of, like, they understand the temptations and the failings and the, like, that's never really exploited, I should say, perhaps, or developed, we might say, in uh, reflections that we might get. Hebrews puts a lot of emphasis on that, and, uh, and this is in keeping also with something that seems to be important in the background for why this book got produced in the first place, which is people seem to be tempted to leave the way. They seem to be being tempted to leave the way of Jesus. And one of the possible temptations is, um, is because they're saying that they're following a Messiah who was executed in a shameful fashion, right? We've talked about crucifixion as not just um, a mode of execution, but a mode of execution that is meant to shame the person who's being executed, to basically declare them as not human. So this has been one of the theories, I think we might say, that people found this, you know, just, it it was too discombobulating, right? It was too disorienting. How could I be devoted to a Messiah who had died the death of a criminal? I mean, that's the basic question. And I think that's a very big question, not just for Hebrews, but for the early Christian movement in general. Um, And they wouldn't have asked that question Let me just be clear, they would not have even asked that question if Jesus wasn't alive, right? I mean, Jesus is raised from the dead. That's what forces them to have to to, to wrestle with the question in a way. So keeping that in mind. So the author of Hebrews, though, doesn't um, sidestep this. In fact, they keep bringing it in. And so what we get in uh, chapter 4 uh, right here, uh, verse 15, and here he's talking about high priests and their ability to um, identify. <clears throat> For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. That's an amazing statement um, on a number of levels, but it's just on the rhetorical level of how this author is talking about a high priest. High priests were understood to be able to identify those whom they represented, but the idea that you that weakness and suffering would open you up to others, that is unique, right? And so Jesus is suffering, his undergoing testing, is not just something that shows how faithful he is and how extraordinary he is, which it does, of course, show that. It also becomes a kind of bridge by which he embraces us because we too suffer. We don't necessarily stand up under the suffering in the same way that he does, but we too suffer. And so this becomes a kind of pathway. Uh, Then at the very beginning of chapter 5, we get a catalog of typical things that high priests do, right? A high priest chosen from among mortals, right? Put in charge of things divine, um, to offer gifts and sacrifices, we talked about that. Am able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward. Someone laughed because they thought, yes, there you go, because they were thinking about their poor pastors. But I'm not, we're not, your poor pastors are not high priests. Um, and, uh, and then does not presume to take the honor, but takes it only when called. Uh, the one, of course, clear distinction uh, that is not directly addressed, but is clearly indirectly addressed everywhere, is that Jesus does not have to offer um, an offering on his own behalf. He himself is not like um, high priest in that way. All right, so that brings us then to uh, our beginning. Uh, Thank you for your patience. So can I get a volunteer?
um, to read our opening passage wherever the mic is. Okay, thanks, Mark. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of this, because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he had suffered. <clears throat> and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. All right, thank you. So we're going to spend a little bit of time on these verses um, because they're quite dense and I think very important for the whole argument. Um, of the book of Hebrews. They're also very important for um, early Christian theology, and I think they continue to be profoundly important um, if we sit with them today uh, in terms of what they have to say about who Jesus is. Um, and especially, uh, I would suggest verse 8 is the, probably the, one of the most important ones. Um, it opens up a whole bunch of different uh, profound questions. So, uh, starting with verse 5, and then, in a sense, into verse 6. Uh, so also, Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So the first thing, just to remind ourselves, I don't have something up here on the outline, but simply... So also, the so also there refers to what we find in verse 4, which is priests, high priests do not appoint themselves. They are appointed. They must be appointed. Um, this has, I think, to do maybe with certain expectations in the ancient world about the, um, the awesome nature of uh, priestly mediation. Um, in the case, certainly, of our... Our argument, it has to do, of course, with the humility of Jesus, right? Um, if, if a normal high priest is humble, so much more the great high priest, right? It's kind of the vision, I think, and the idea. So Jesus' humility and obedience here are background to this idea of being selected, Jesus being selected in a sense. <clears throat> um, Jesus does not seek out his own glory, but rather he seeks to do the will of his Father, which, of course, is a, um, I don't know, a locution that we hear, phrase that we hear in most of the Gospels. Um, and as we've already mentioned, these verses, verses 5 and 6, connect us uh, to verse 4, and they do so in this uh, rabbinic way, this call vomer, which I think I've defined for you in the um, appendix, but it's this comparison of if one thing is true over here and it's lesser, how much more so is it going to be over here, right? And so uh, we, we get then these uh, quotes, and I, I, I didn't find, I don't think I kind of ran across anything in the commentators, but... The use here of these different, you are my son today, I have begotten you, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. These all, most of this material, I believe, comes from Psalm 109. And it is, the, the author is playing with different portions and linking them together, right? And so, of course, the first one is uh, uh, simply the appointing, the idea of appointing. You are my son today, I have begotten you. Now, it raises questions, certainly, later on for Trinitarian theology, et cetera. It doesn't really raise any significant um, major questions here, though it maybe puts a little bit of a grain of sand in the, you know, um, in the oyster that eventually will produce the pearl. I don't know. I got oysters still in my mind, so what are you going to do? I was just down the land of oysters, so. I was in North Carolina 
Outer Banks. Um, it was it was great. Um, but then we get really, I think, the verse that we or the quote that the author, in a in a way, hangs a lot of the argument on, which is in verse six. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So this is sort of a bona fides, um, uh, kind of laying down a card. <clears throat> Jesus is a high priest. One of the, I think I put it to you, a sort of conundrum of the book, um, like a background question is, if we're expecting a priestly Messiah, which I think we have to, assume that this author is coming out of that tradition. Well, Jesus is not a Levite, so how can he possibly be a priest? He doesn't come from the proper line. We got the king line all straightened out, but what about the priestly line? Well, this becomes then the way that you're going to engage that. It's through a different line, um, but one that is no less potent and powerful and authoritative in the sort of imagery of the Old Testament, and that is the Melchizedek line. Um, this is going to obviously come back to us because this will be central to the argument in chapters 7 through 10, which is the other section where we get a lot of stuff on Melchizedek. Um, it's in comparison to Aaron. Aaron's priesthood is the Levitical priesthood. And very importantly, Aaron's priesthood was never understood to be an eternal priesthood, which is something that the author is also going to play up. Um, it's understood to be a provisional priesthood in a sense, whereas the Melchizedek priesthood, based primarily on this one verse uh, in Psalm 109, uh, is declared to be a kind of eternal priesthood. Um, part of this is just sort of the, I'm assuming, the imaginative imagery Melchizedek, if you remember, is a figure, and maybe you don't remember this, but in the book of Genesis, Melchizedek, um, and the name uh, Mel, uh, Melchizedek, I'm trying to think, it has a specific name, um, like it's like priest of the king, I think, or something like that, but he is a figure who lives in Jerusalem before it becomes Jerusalem, and Abram I don't know if he's got his name changed yet to Abraham, but he's wandering around and he comes upon, he and his clan come upon Melchizedek and he makes an offering to Yahweh through Melchizedek. Um, and then Melchizedek disappears. Like, so literally in chapter eight, what we're going to hear about from the author of Hebrews is that nobody knows the lineage. Nobody knows, in other words, where, where Melchizedek came from and nobody knows where, where Melchizedek went. And therefore, it's eternal. It's kind of the idea, sort of the argument, I think. So that's kind of the background and, and the way that the author is, I think, thinking about this. Now, when we shift, this is, that's an important component, but maybe the even richer material here is uh, verses 7 through 10, uh, particularly verses, I guess, 7 and 8. Um, in the day, and, and here is, you know, <laughs> this is one of those texts that is really worth sitting with a long, for a long time. This is a description, of course, of Jesus, right? In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. There's that mathane, pathane. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, there's, a, there's several things happening here, all right? And we're going to do our best to unpack some of these. But one of the things that I want you to notice is at the very end here in verse 10, the author does not shy away from the idea that Jesus suffers, um, that Jesus is fully human. In fact, this is part and parcel of his identity as a priest in the order of Melchizedek. So here again is that place where 
um, the author is not going to step away from the shamefulness of Jesus' death, but rather is going to lean into it and see that it is, in fact, a fountain of life. The, the idea that Jesus died such a death is, in fact, a, a life-giving reality, a life-giving thing. So what can we say? Uh, I have a lot of material here on verse 7. So the first is in the days of his flesh. Um, on the surface, of course, this simply refers to the life of Jesus. Um, but one of the things that I want to uh, underline for you, and I do think is important, is that the word here for flesh, there are two different words that you can use for body or embodiment, at least two. There might be some more in the Greek, but there are two very prominent ones. One is soma, the soma, S-O-M-A, and the other is sarx, S-A-R-X. Now, the soma, if you were reading a discourse on the beauty of the human body, you would encounter the word soma all the time. It would be talking about the beauty of the muscles and the skin and all that kind of stuff. If you were reading a book about how difficult it is to be human and, you know, having to cut toenails and wipe your butt and all that kind of gross stuff and the fact that you cough and phlegm comes out of your body, then you would be reading about sarks. What word is here? Sarks, right? So it is in the, de it is in the days of his being fully human, right, in a sense. The weakness in a way, right? This, this terminology, Sarx, carries with it the connotation, association with weakness, with permeability, um, uh, et cetera. And so I think we can say something like this, that Jesus was subject to the same fears and uh, struggles that we, were, that we are subject to, even the fear of death that afflicts us all. And I, we talked about this last time, about fear of death. And I think you had brought up that there are a lot of people that you know, um, Peggy, I think you had mentioned there are a lot of people that you know that are not afraid to die. And I, I thought a lot about that, um, which is sad to say during my vacation, but I did. And uh, one of the things I think it's important for us to think about, because we were talking about the fear of death makes us do all kinds of things, right? And that that seems to be one of the operating assumptions of many of the biblical authors, that it's the fear of death that leads to all kinds of, you know, sins or acts of preservation, right? And I, I thought about, well, it's probably, it probably might be even, might be true that some of us are not ourselves afraid to die and therefore will let death come to us. But what about those around us? That's where oftentimes our fear of death is the most pronounced, and our actions perhaps are the most, you know. So that fear of death, right, the, the idea of, um, uh, of, of an ending, I guess, and of where someone might go, uh, which afflicts us and leads us to do all kinds of things. Jesus himself knows what that is like, right? When John the Baptist is beheaded, what does it say that Jesus does? He withdraws to a quiet place because of his friend's death, the sadness of that. Um, <clears throat> now, the background for most of the material in this passage is Psalm 22. Um, and uh, this whole of, this is, I'm saying here, the whole of verse 7 is framed by Psalm 22. I think we could probably push it up into maybe even verse 8, but... Psalm 22 is the psalm of the righteous sufferer. Um, it is the psalm from which the cry of dereliction that Jesus utters on the cross comes from. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, if you read that psalm, the first half of that psalm really is, where are you, God? I've been abandoned by you. My closest friends, etc., have turned their backs on me, right? Um, I am undone. And then the second half of the psalm is, nevertheless, I will trust in you. I will trust that you will rescue me, etc. So you get this profound, um, ac almost accusation. Where are you, God? How could this happen? But also in the midst of that accusation, whether or not it should, we should say it gives way, or whether or not we should say that they live side by side, I'll leave that up to you. 
um, but also this profound affirmation that even though all appearances say one thing, I know that God is faithful. That's what I will trust, right? So you get both of those there. So this whole verse 7, right, in the days of his flesh, he offers up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who is able to save him from death. And he's heard because of his reverent submission. In a sense, that entire verse, I think, is kind of um, echoing from Psalm 22. Um, so what do we mean here? What does this mean? Offered up prayers and supplications with cries and tears. The first thing we can say, I think, is that this um, description that the author offers to us is vague enough for it to apply to several or perhaps all of the life of Jesus, several episodes. The most obvious episodes that are put forward are either Gethsemane or Golgotha. Right. Is this Gethsemane or is it Golgotha that we're talking about? And the reason why these become the most obvious is because these are the places where we hear about Jesus offering up tears and prayers um, and cries, etc. cetera. Um, because, though, this, is, this statement is so sort of generic in a way. It is generic, but of course it's not generic. But... It's so vague, I should say. Um, it could be a, a applied to the whole of Jesus's life, actually, which would fit, um, in particular, verse 8, um, because verse 8 tells us that Jesus essentially learns obedience over time. And you could imagine him having multiple experiences like this. And if it's true that he understands what it means to be human, I could tell you I've had too many experiences, right? And, and even having the multiple experiences is part of the, the human condition. So it wouldn't surprise me, right, if he'd gone through that. So this is that whole question about the nature of the humanity that Jesus has. So Jesus offers up those prayers and supplications with cries and tears. To whom? To the one, right, who can save from death. To Yahweh, to his Father, to God, right? And here is clearly an echo of the high priestly function that we're going to hear. As I mentioned here uh, on the outline, as other priests offer gifts and sacrifices, Jesus' gift and sacrifice is his faithfulness embodied in his real uh, and genuine vulnerability and even in his cry of distress, right? In other words, to cry out to God um, and to ask where God is is not an act of faithlessness. It's actually still very much a faithful act because you're talking to God, essentially. Um, and I think this is kind of the point, in a way, uh, that the author is after. So I like to utilize this language when I talk about the life of Jesus um, and, and particularly what happens to Jesus on the cross, and that is that Jesus is faithful unto death. He remains truly Jesus all the way up to the end. Uh, and I know when we went through, you know, when we were talking in Acts or something, or maybe when I was teaching my class on, uh, hey, Dave, uh, when I was teaching my class on the book, uh, my book, I mentioned that, um, that Jesus is consistently Jesus all the way up to the end. And one of the places where they see that is that he's forgiving people from the cross. <laughs> so... There's a kind of faith, that's, that's kind of what I'm talking about here. I think I want to pause, because I think I might have seen a hand. Do you have the, can we pass the mic over? I've always thought of Jesus being born, Jesus, Son of God, and all put together. I never think of him before now developing, developing tolerance, developing ability to withstand disappointment and pain and which is the human side right and i do think that the book of hebrews in particular makes this contribution to how the new testament thinks about jesus because because there are places where you do feel you know like the book of john in particular is really where you feel like jesus is all kind of put together in some ways at least on a surface reading but there is the play, there are a couple places, right? The, the book of Luke, uh, 
you get these little pictures of Jesus, you know, growing in wisdom, et cetera. Um, and these are passages, by the way, that are debated, of course, in the history of the Christian tradition, in part because of some of the metaphysical things that, that we wind up saying about who Jesus is. But we can put some of that stuff aside because that's later dogmatic entailments and developments, et cetera. Clearly, this author, it seems to me, is imagining Jesus as someone who, over time, develops at the same time that Jesus is always already something else, and they don't have to have a theory to work them out in their head. Yeah, Barb. Um, does anyone think that, you know, when Jesus was baptized and the voice from heaven said, this is my son, is that the first time he was completely God's son? There certainly has been a history, yeah, there's, that's been a position um, in the uh, Christian tradition that, t that oftentimes is pejoratively called adoptionism. Um, it's, that's the adoptive moment. Um, so, and that pr probably you know, shows up uh, second, third century as a kind of position that's its own. I think when you're in that first century, those first couple of early, the early second century, you really have all of these different ideas kind of banging against each other, and there's no such thing as orthodoxy in the way that we think about it later on. So you can have these different ideas and not have to resolve them yet. So this does become a question that people have about how do we, how are we to think about that question, and if you. And it, I would say a lot, of, a lot of theology and a lot of doctrine and the choices that people make, um, I would suggest oftentimes boils down to what questions can I live with? What questions do I need answers to and what questions can I live with being open? And, um, and so if you settle on one thing to close certain questions, then that's gonna, you know, the irony is that it often opens up other, others. So eventually there needs to be, or at least the way that the, I should say, I don't want to make this so that it had to be this way, but as history unfolds, eventually the church is like, we need, we, we have come to affirm that this is somehow God in the flesh. So our understanding of what, of who and what God is seems to preclude any idea of development. Therefore, what are we going to do with all these development passage about who Jesus is? And that's going to create some of that conundrum. Um, and those are questions that continue to be live today. And I would say probably the 20th century, in a way, because of the horrors of World War I, World War II, Auschwitz, and now we can add all the other horrible things, that really did, in 19th century too, but that really brought in this question about the development, the susceptibility of Jesus to suffering, et cetera, which were live questions and had been there you know, you can look back and find people like, for instance, Thomas Aquinas believed that Jesus was completely capable of sinning. In fact, his flesh was sinful flesh. Thomas Aquinas, the person whom Catholic doctrine is built on, believe that, right? That's so you can find all kinds of these people, um, but it really takes in some ways like the experience of history probably to put other things on uh, the agenda. All right, there were some hands. Okay, Linda. I was going to say that same person, though, thought that those same people, pull up, pull up. the same people thought that the divine left Jesus before the cross. The uh, adoptionist? Yeah. I don't know if that's the yeah, case, but that's it wouldn't. It wouldn't or whatever his name was. Yeah, it wouldn't. That died in 100 A.D. Had this theory that oh. he descended into Christ and then he left oh. before the crucifixion. And so, I'm sure there's probably other adoptionists who think that the divine stayed there. But yeah, you're now you're getting into the refineries of well, the Harris of the history of Christology. Yeah, that I don't know if I have the enough knowledge uh, to work with, which typically I do. So that kind of surprises me. Thank you, Linda. Yeah. I'm not understanding the word adoptionist. If Jesus is God, 
where did the adoption come in? Okay, we're getting now. Thanks a lot for opening up that can of worms. Um, this, by the way, is a position that eventually the church rejects. But the idea is <clears throat> that uh, it's at the, it, it's sort of, I, 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 here's me working with kind of my vague memory of some of this. Um, it's either a process or it's the, the event of baptism, but this is the moment of God's identifying Jesus as son. And uh, the, the adoptionist heresy, at least as it comes later to be described, and it has been presented to me, and this is where I would say there's so many texts that we don't have access to, so just take, you know, a uh, grain of salt, but that God looks down, sees Jesus, and decides to adopt him at that moment of baptism. That's the idea. <clears throat> so wasn't, was simply human and was righteous before that, but, this, but that the divine had somehow not entered in. So anyway, uh, Barb, what are you doing? Are you opening more cans of worms? You got to come over here and get the mic. If you really want to make this hard, you got to get up. My thing, my thing. Okay, then my question is in Psalm 2, verse 7, where it says, I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you, not adopted you, but begotten you. So where does this adoption business come from? This, you're just, re, you're kind of rehashing, I think, some of the history of dogmatic debate. In fact, begotten does become a key technical term. Um, because to, to beget, the way that they begin to read that terminology is that this is um, not a one-time, but rather is a constant process. So in other words, the vision that eventually develops in Trinitarian theology is that the Son is always coming forth from the Father. There's no sort of once begotten way back when. It's always happening. And therefore, God is eternally productive and generative and giving, essentially giving birth constantly. That that's part of what it means to be God. But that, that will become then in the kind of niceties of theological debate where they'll say, we have a term begotten <clears throat> that's different than adoption that can make the point that we're trying to make. But that's a, that's a metaphysical argument again that is well beyond the confines of, of what we're doing here. But no, it's okay. It looks like we stirred up a hornet's nest. I got some more here. Go ahead. No, I don't think so. On? Okay. Um, so how does this fit in with John 1 that says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God? <laughs> And the word was with God. Yeah, so that's exactly, these are exactly the kinds of texts that they wind up writing to each other about and having arguments over. So, And the ultimate argument is that it doesn't fit. So in a way, what happens, this, is, this would be, and I think this is instructive for all of us, really, which is none of us come to Scripture with like a blank slate, we all of us bring something to it. And the question is, am I aware that I'm bringing something to this or not? And therefore, you know, self-awareness and the need to allow that to be critiqued. In this case, and in the sort of the illustration that I kind of want to do or kind of develop here very quickly is, um, we allow certain texts or stories to be more determinative than others for who God is, right? Because there are certain places in Scripture that seem to imply one thing about God, but that seems to contradict something else. And we wind up having to make a choice. Well, which one do we think is the more determinative? Because if we, if we decide it's this one, then what we're going to do is we're not we might ignore that one, or we might simply try to reread that one in the light of this one. Right? So in this case, you have these two texts. You have the baptism text, and you have the prologue of John. 
And I would think it'd be fair to say that the, that the sort of broad Catholic, lowercase c, church, the universal church, opts to say that the prologue of John is the more determinative for how we understand who Jesus is. So then the problem becomes, well, what exactly happens at the baptism? Because that's no longer, we no longer have an answer that we used to have, which was, this is the moment that Jesus becomes somehow fully God. And I think one of the, there are many different ways that that gets reread. One of them is that this is the place where God fully reveals who Jesus is, because it simply it kind of proceeds. But but I think that's an instructive example for a lot of us for how we've experienced God, um, and we've heard the the gospel uh, in certain kinds of ways. So, for instance, my book is my own argument for this is a central narrative I would suggest to you in scripture it can be contested you can disagree with it that's totally fine but this is what I think is central right I think central to God's character is God's mercy is God's justice and righteousness and I try to describe what those look like that means I'm going to read other passages that don't seem to fit with that in light of the ones that I think really do seem to reflect it. And of course, I could be wrong, and so I have to be open to be corrected, right? That's kind of the way that most of us operate with, um, but typically we don't operate it with, with that consciously, you know? Yeah. Oh, we need a, we have a, we're getting into the weeds the, of theology, so I should probably move us forward, even though I love theology. Um, maybe it is the weeds, I hope, to close it. But I, I thought um, what you just said was a couple things kind of spoke to me. Um, one being that you can hold both of something to be true and um, it doesn't really change who Jesus was or what his work was. And also um, when you said, well... Now I've lost that, but um, these different things that people argued about aren't essential to the character of Jesus, so we don't have to have an answer. I think you said something about theology being what you're comfortable with, and this whole discussion made me start thinking about the discussion of whether there was a virgin birth when this was all talked about around Christmas and um in various discussions with people, I've heard some people say, well, you know, there had to be a virgin birth. But all of these things we don't really know, and it doesn't change anything about the character of Jesus. I guess that's just an opinion that I have. But if you hold that it had to be at the incarnation, at the time of conception, and that it had to be a virgin birth, then... You know, it made me think what you were saying about these are things that we bring from our own selves, and we don't really know the answer, I guess. Yeah, uh, the, the one example, and this will be the last comment I'll make, so I'm not taking any more questions, um, is the Catholic Church and the Orthodox churches in the East um, they share a lot theologically, but they also have some pretty profound differences. Um, but, and I, I won't go into exactly to kind of flesh that out, but they have a pretty close, um, sensibility about the nature of the Lord's Supper, right? What they would call the Eucharist. And in the Catholic Church, under the guidance of Aquinas and Aristotelian metaphysics, Aquinas develops this theory that the you know that, that, that literally the body and blood of Jesus are present because the elements are changed, and he offers a metaphysical account of this. The Orthodox response, in a sense, that I've kind of heard over time is that. Yeah, but, you know, the problem is that Aquinas is basically trying to explain something that really shouldn't be explained. 
And I think to me that captures a little bit of, um, there are some things that we want explained. They don't necessarily need to explain. Maybe they, maybe they, maybe they do in a certain moment. But do they need to be? Does that explanation need to be binding for the rest of history? That that that's to me that's an interesting example of of how to think about some of this. Because I don't want to downplay that theology, et cetera, is completely unimportant. <clears throat> because I don't believe that. Number one. Uh, and number two, we should be reflective on our faith um, and informed, of course. But I but I agree to a certain extent. Yeah, exactly what you're getting at, right? That there are <clears throat> there are some things that we can that we can and should be able to live with in the tension. Um, so, all right. So with that digression digressed, um, we turn to the rest of verse seven, the very last phrase, right? And he was heard. He was heard because of his reverent submission. Um, this also, of course, raises uh, a profound theological question. It raises a sort of historical question, I suppose. The historical question, we might put this way, um, does this refer to some other time in Jesus' life? This is why I said that the that, uh, rendering in verse 7 does seem like it can very much be applied to Golgotha or Gethsemane, but it's also vague enough that it could be applied to the rest of his life, to Jesus' life, where he also would have cried out um, for God's help and guidance. Um, I think that's kind of, in a sense, like what, we, what the author to the Hebrews is challenging us to keep in mind is that Jesus also had to walk a faithful life. And we're, we are in very good company if we try to imitate what he did. Because he too tried, like he too was faced with uncertainty. Like the idea would be he too is faced with uncertainty. He too is faced with testing. He too is faced with weakness. He too cried out to the one who could save him. And he was heard, right? It's kind of the idea. Um, if we raise this, if we particularly apply this to the cross, which I think is appropriate because Psalm 22 is directly quoted from the cross. This raises a different kind of question that um, I don't know if there's a precise answer or if there's just something worth sitting with. And what I think is worth sitting with is that in some way the proposal of the author and of Psalm 22 and really of the crucifixion scene is that Jesus does indeed cry out to be rescued but his rescue has to be on the other side of death. If we're going to understand it that way, like if we're going to say, and he was heard, and here the he was heard means he's raised, he's raised from the dead. Um, but that raises really profound questions too, right, about the nature of crying out, about the nature of rescue, about the nature of God's faithfulness. What does that look like exactly? So was Jesus heard? Yes, this is the argument, right? Um, that we might say that the author, if we were applying this especially to resurrection, right? The resurrection of Jesus is God's answer for his cry to be saved. And, yeah, I mean, I, I think of the, the words of the prophet Jonah from the belly of the whale, crying out from deep to deep to be rescued, Right? Uh, and that, too, has been an image used oftentimes of, uh, of Jesus. So the whole then of this verse, in a way, becomes further reinforcement of Jesus' own faithfulness over against, of course, the negative image, which is the faithlessness of the wilderness generation and, of course, potentially the hearers, right? Because this is what the author is concerned with and seems to be very concerned with, by the way, once we get up into chapter six, where he's like, you can't turn around if you don't, if you, if you keep going the direction you're going. 
<clears throat> so what, it, what, it, what? How could we elaborate just slightly? We could say the wilderness generation does not believe, did not believe in the power of the God who raises the dead. Is essentially that, and I'm taking here a locution, a phrasing that comes out of Paul when he and he's talking about Abraham, and he's like Abraham did believe in the God who raises the dead, which is why he believed that he would get Isaac back. Um, and we're going to apply this here, the same kind of language to the problem with the wilderness generation is that they only saw what was impossible in front of them. They only saw death. They did not see the God who raises the dead, right? And that that became, in a way, ingredient of their faithlessness. <clears throat> so, and I think here is the beauty, right? This last phrase, this last thing. The faithfulness exhibited by Jesus is trusting in God beyond all hope and human calculation. Paul has this beautiful phrase, I think it's in Romans 12, where he talks hope against hope. Like he says, that's the kind of hope we're talking about. That's why this is not optimism. That's why this is hope, because it is beyond human calculation. It is beyond anything that we could call human hope. It is in the God who raises the dead. Um, at the very end, let's see. Oh, oh excuse me, uh, in our time. I don't know why that's there, actually. I apologize. That should not be there. Um, all right, let me move on. <laughs> I'm hoping we're going to get to the end of chapter five today. Oh, boy. Barb. <laughs> no, I love it. That was actually, I really enjoyed that. So um, so starting again, right, in verse eight, um, this is another text then that particularly raises the profound questions we've been circling around. I'm not going to belabor this too much longer, but simply to say that this really is the one Peggy, in particular, that kind of connects to your comment about that, that Jesus developed. And um, the, the extraordinary thing to think about here is that, on the one hand, one could say the human Jesus developed. But there's an open question about how, like, does, does the experience of the human Jesus affect God, the divine? And that's a big question that Christian theology wrestles with. What happens to God on the cross if, that's, if that is God up there? Does God experience death? So a different version of that question is, does God experience also growth in the kind of human experience? Maybe we could put that slightly differently, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting one to think with. So verse 8 What's interesting here, of course, are a number of things. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Now, up to this point, um, except for chapter 2, verse 10, the reference to the sonship of Jesus typically has a very, very positive ring to it. It's exaltation language, right? Um, so even though, in other words, you could, say, you could read that even though Jesus was in a privileged position, he still had to go through the trial. It's kind of the way that the author is talking. Um, so even though, and I think this, we might even say, this is how this author might have worked out the kind of doctrinal, even though he was the son of God, he still had to develop. It's kind of the, the way that perhaps uh, they might state this. So <clears throat> it establishes this dialectic that is not resolved um, within the book of Hebrews, but also I would suggest within the New Testament in general, and that is that Jesus was always a son, and yet he also became a son, right? Because one of our passages back in chapter 2 says that he became a son through going through what, it, what he went through, um, etc. So, mathain pathain, right? Learning is suffering. To learn is to suffer, this is a commonplace notion um, with the idea that knowledge costs you something. To know something is costly. Um, and you can put that in any different 
many different ways, obviously. You can draw many different conclusions and inferences, I suppose, from that. Um, the background of Mothane Pothane is athletics. So this is an athletic background. What does the athlete do? They train their body. They train their body. They make their body learn to do certain things. Is that training enjoyable? Probably a little bit, but not enough, right? Probably what's really enjoyable is winning the race, right, typically. Yeah, exactly. That's right. I know uh, folks online may not have heard that, but no pain, no gain would be a great modern uh, pa uh, parallel or corollary. So uh, what we have then, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Um, and here, kind of to play on the uh, imagery of clothed in weakness, which we've heard a few other times, uh, one of the commentators wrote a very, very interesting excursus. Um, uh, an excursus is kind of like a reflection um, at this point on what is, what is being said here, in a sense. And... Part of the argument that this author wants to make is that, in a sense, being human is also bound up with being in time. And being in time is a moment-by-moment -moment experience. And for us to know what it means to be obedient to God, or to, well, if, we don't, if you don't like that language, to be faithful to God, is not something that happens once. It's something that has to happen moment by moment. And that that is part, perhaps part of what the author is imagining, that the full range of human experience includes the idea that you live moment by moment and that every day you choose to turn one way or the other, right? And Jesus chose to turn every moment towards God the Father. And so the kind of the... The encouragement is for them to think about doing the same, of course. Um, as he does this, of course, he suffers, right? He learned obedience through what he suffered. Obedience here, um, and I don't have a comment for you on the outline, but obedience is very closely linked in the book of Hebrews to faith. What it means to be faithful and to have faith is to be obedient. These two things kind of um, coincide. Now, the question, of course, is obedient to whom and to what? So we know that obedience language can be very dangerous language. Um, and so I think we want to deploy that carefully. Um, but that is very much um, a component of the book of Hebrews. So then verses 9 through 10, and having been made perfect, he became the source. So after all this, and this is sort of the interesting thing, right? He had to go through all that to become right, which gets us back to this unresolved dialectic. So, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who not only trust in him, but obey him, right, for all who obey him, for all who enter into the way of Jesus, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So, seeing the process of being human through to the end, Right? That's kind of the idea. So seeing the process through ends in perfection and final liberation from death. That's, and I'm, of course, talking here about Jesus himself. And what does that mean? That means eternal salvation. Um, eternal salvation here, I think, again, is another way of describing entering into God's way of being, entering into God's life. That's what it means here. Um, and it's interesting that the way we enter into God's life is that we enter into God's life. We enter into the way of Jesus, right? In the sense that these two things kind of fold into each other. So uh, this also, of course, um, picks up for us the idea that Jesus didn't do this for himself. He did this for all of us. Right? We're all included in this, and that's where the kind of the Melchizedek priestly language 
Um, and now, um, in case, we, and we might miss it, uh, certainly we would 2,000 years later, but now to say that Jesus, this guy that they knew who was shamefully executed, to say that he is now the source of eternal life is extraordinary because only Yahweh, and remember, he, this is an author talking to Hebrews, talking to Jews, right? So he is, in a sense, equal with God. Um, at the very least, as consort, as partner, as one who bears, you know, and again, the author doesn't give us some metaphysics on how to work all this out, um, but wants to make for us a claim, in a sense, that's this. What you see Jesus doing is basically God's doing that. That's why he's worth following, right? That's kind of the argument, in a sense. So suffering, being open to others, um, serving, faithfulness, et cetera, which, you know, you would get a more fulsome picture and hopefully more positive <laughs> description in some other places, which we will. Um, Nevertheless, the way of, I mean, in a sense, it all boils down to the way of Jesus is the way of God. I think that's kind of the way it comes down to. Um, and that is a way that endures. Um, and I think this is, uh, you know, where sort of the resurrection imagery, uh, the thing that Jesus offers to God in the heavenly temple is the whole of his life, because it is the whole of his life that is raised from the dead um, and is a gift now to us to follow. All right, I've given you a lot to chew on, and we only got through <laughs> six verses. Um, how about if we, can I get through the rest of this? Yeah, let's do this really quick. We'll do the last, so that at least I can say we're done with chapter five. Um, where's uh? Could, would you mind reading for us uh, the passage? There's the yeah, verses eleven through fourteen. Excuse me. About this, we have much to say that is hard to explain, since you have become dull in understanding. For though by this time you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the basic elements of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food, for everyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is unskilled in the word of righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose faculties have been trained by practice to distinguish good from evil. Great words to leave you with today. <laughs> Um, actually, the harder words are the next few verses, so I'm actually glad we're stopping here so we can deal with those next time. Uh, one thing that I did provide for you, I think, right in your outline is the rhetorical structure. Do you see that in your... Okay, so the purpose or reason I wanted to do this, in part, was I thought this was helpful. It's a kind of a helpful way to see the structure of some of the argument, and it pretty much is oscillating between exposition or explaining something and then exhorting or like nudging people to do certain things. So what you have is an exposition and then here's what you should do in light of that. Exposition, here's what you should do, right? So you keep getting this um, oscillation. We've just finished a significant exposition, clearly one that is dense and worth sitting with. Um, we're gonna get to another very lengthy exposition when we get to chapter seven. So the material that we're turning to now, the very end of five up into six, is exhortation material, but it's also the last exhortation material before the longest exposition. And if the exposition is the kind of stuff that like, it's hard to follow, you sort of drift off, you come back, then the purpose, my point here, it, it, I really do have a point, my purpose, the purpose of this material right now that we're about to read and the stuff that comes right after it is to grab your attention. It's supposed to shock you a little bit. And I think that's why the hype, it's so hyperbole, like basically like you can't repent if you don't, you know, you know that, that's what you get is that language. I'm gonna offer some 
other thoughts with that uh, when we talk about it next week. But so that's why I provided this for you so that you could see because it does give you a sense about why this material that we're getting ready to turn to is so sharp and a little bit dark. Um, it's primarily trying to grab people's attention before the really long um, exposition. So I've already kind of said most of this material here. It's an intense exhortation. At this point, if people had been listening, um, if this was a sermon or a letter that's being read, it would have taken about 15 or so more minutes to read it. And uh, I think according to most data nowadays, it's what, seven minutes is the most people can hang uh, and not kind of lose attention. So you're kind of almost at the double point now of that. And this is why you've gotten these exhortations that are really sharp. And now we get this one, which is like, you know, I'm telling you guys about the most extraordinary, beautiful, amazing things, but you don't understand it because you're just too stupid. That's kind of what it sounds, that's really is kind of what it sounds like a little bit. And I do think some of that is meant to kind of cajole us as hearers, all of us, probably. So if the hearers have been listening, so uh, we've already made this point, right? Chapter seven to 10. Um, so about this, about this, we have much to say that it's hard to explain, right? That he, the, the author is basically like ready to kind of start unspooling a little bit of what they've said in five, and that's what they're going to start doing in chapter seven. But before we do that, I need to address the fact that you guys can't hear is kind of the way that I think the author uh, is talking. So the discourse that we've already heard now, right, Jesus as mediator as high priest who's entered into God's presence has now become the source of salvation. We might also add in a few other things here, right? That his suffering, etc. cetera. Um, and, but the suffering and obedience of Jesus is also in a way a contrast potentially to the community itself, right? That here is Jesus um, who learned obedience, and here is a community that has become dull. And some of the language here that we hear, right, um, for though by this time, it, no, I guess it actually starts before, since you have become dull in your understanding, if you remember one of the accusations against the wilderness generation was what? That their hearts had been hardened. To become dull is just a synonym. It's pretty much the same thing. So this tells us that the author is particularly concerned about this community and its ability to hear um, uh, the gospel and respond. So what do we get? Uh, we get this image of teachers um, and students of mature and immature which would be commonplace. Uh, and that is an immature student needs milk, a mature student needs food, needs meat, right? That's sort of the imagery here. Um, <clears throat> and of course it plays with the, I, the image of children, right? Uh, young children, they can't handle, they can't digest certain things. They need the milk, the nutrients, et cetera. Um, you need someone, so for this time, though this time you want to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic elements. Basic elements of the, of the is literally the ABCs. That's what the author is saying. So the, the basic elements are the stoichia. Um, and so you need to learn, you need to relearn basically the ABCs because you don't even seem to understand the basics. So how can I talk to you about God suffering or Jesus suffering and that being um, a, a doorway to you when you don't seem to even understand the basics. Um, that's a problem uh, uh, that the community needs to, to address. For everyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is unskilled in the word of righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose faculties have been trained by practice to distinguish good and evil. The imagery being used here is the athletic, is athletic imagery or the imagery of learning, um, which is 
uh, in the ancient world, in particular, they believed that you learned by um, doing something again and again and again, right? Um, and of course, we, we, we retain some elements of that, um, but we don't simply make people memorize things anymore like they used to. So reasoning about righteousness has to do with um, the moral life. And the way that what the author is essentially saying is that if you're only, if you're only doing milk, you don't even know how to distinguish between good and evil. You're not mature enough to know how to do that. It's only the mature, the people who have gone through the process over time where, they, where it becomes habitual, in other words, because that's what an athlete does. They're, that's why they kind of, right, they get all these repetitive injuries because they're trying to make their bodies repeat something again and again and again. Make the shot, Caitlin Clark, make the shot, make the shot, right? She probably thousands of shots a day, I bet, right? So that it'll go off. So. Um, so the, the point here is that you haven't gone through that process, and if you had gone through that process, you would certainly not be immature, you would be mature. So that is where true discernment between good and evil happens. It happens over time and uh, through practice, essentially. All right, I'm gonna stop there. You all have been very generous. Um, we got almost to where I wanted to get to. Um, but not quite, which is actually fine because the next, <laughs> there's some verses in this next passage that I'm not excited about teaching you. Um, so anyway, let me, yeah, <laughs> you're, you're welcome, you're welcome. Yeah, you don't have to come back if you don't want to, you can self-select. Um, I could take a question or two if you haven't. I think Jeff's got a question in the back. Um, we're hearing mostly, we've been hearing today about this argument that was going on 2,000 years ago about Jesus and his authority. Is, I mean, is that, is that question as relevant today or has that not been kind of resolved or, I mean, it seems like we're rehashing old arguments. Um... I'm not, a, I'm not exactly sure what question you're asking, but I'm going to do my best to answer what well, I think answer you're asking. Answer some question. I'm going to answer the question I think you should have asked. <laughs> well, I tell you guys you can do that all the time. You can answer the question I think I should have asked. Um, definitely, this is, of course, 2,000 years ago. And I think part of what I'm trying to do by bringing up the differences between then and now is to dislodge a little bit of our familiarity with how we might read these passages because we have been affected for good or ill by all those many years after, by the theologies that we've heard, etc. If we can do that, then we're put into a different, I think, position to hear something new and startling. And I do feel that one of my tasks, uh, and it's also a task that I try to apply to myself, is to allow scripture to be strange again, to allow it to speak out of the wildness you know, that it's coming from, the perspective that it's coming from. The big thing to me that I think here goes, it kind of transcends these questions about 2,000 years versus now, is the basic argument that the author's trying to make is that Jesus' suffering is not a sideshow. It's actually part and parcel of his expression of faithfulness. And we ourselves are called to also be faithful, to enter into the way of Jesus. Now, what does suffering mean here? Obviously, initially, we think cross. We initially think being arrested, all those things. It could simply mean the suffering of trying to love others, which is hard. Right, because you have to sacrifice sometimes, often, off, often all the time, your own desires, your own will, your own agenda. Right, so you could, we could, we could render suffering differently, but I think the argument here is is precisely that what saves us is entering into the way of Jesus. 
it's not just something happened on the cross 2,000 years ago and I've got my get out of jail free card and put him in my back pocket. It's that there's an invitation to us to live into that. And I think that's something that transcends 2,000 years. So I hope that's helpful. Thanks. Um, okay, brothers and sisters, next week we will be moving forward. Let me uh, say a prayer as we leave. Um, I know we've had uh, some loss in our circles. I think Dave Getch. Have there been any other that we names? Okay, so pray pray for Randy's wife. Is she ill again? Okay, all right. So if I don't name, let the names that bubble up in your own hearts um, go before God, and um, let's pray together. Lord, it is uh, it is a privilege and an honor to be able to turn to you in the midst of the day and to speak with you, creator of all things. We thank you for time. We thank you for space. We thank you for this community, for fellowship, for our own lives. We pray, Lord, for those whom we know who are grieving, who are experiencing significant loss, that you are there with them, that you are present to them, and that we are present to them in the ways that you give to us to be present, whether that's in our minds or hearts or directly or not. We think of the Getch family, Diane, whom we know and love, and Dave, who many of us have known for many years as he's passed into your presence. We thank you for his life and his family and pray for a blessing for them. And we think also of our brother Randy and his wife as she continues to walk this road. May many, many hands and many, many feet and many others come alongside and walk with her. Be with us now as we go forth, we pray and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.